I'd like to welcome everybody to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim, and I would like to uh, let you know that we meet here every Saturday at 8 o'clock at Dabber's East Restaurant in Addison in Chicago. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. We first have a brief announcements period, then our speaker, then we have our speaker gives his presentation, then we have a a question and answer period and then our infamous rebuttal period. Just as a brief reminder, these proceedings will be taped and you can access the follow the past videos from the College of Complexes archive by clicking on the uh, camera at the College of Complexes website or you can access it through my own website which is www.timsvideo.com. Videos are not going back to 20. Base Mike Flores was born in an 80 base in San Diego and was whisked away to Hawaii and then Japan where he would grow up. His family moved to the deep south during segregation, which as you might imagine was a culture shock. As he grew up in the specter of the draft in Vietnam, hovered over, over his teens who thought about life and death in ways previous generation hadn't. Mike was sent off to military school where he set up a protest against the Vietnam War and was promptly thrown out. His parents let him know he wasn't wanted in his military family when he left home at 12 to join the circus, which in this case were the hippies of Atlanta. He began writing for the cover of a sitting he organized to stop mandatory ROTC, which over 80% of the student body participated in. Mike was knocked out by Atlanta police as he handed the petitions to the principal. He came in, he came to in the principal's office to look out the window and see the police cars overturned and on fire. Police battling students, Mike had been out for two hours. The battle raged into the night. No one called a doctor for him, by the way. This made the news wires and SDS, Students for Democratic Society, came calling. Mike ended up in the Chicago area as one of the staff of New Left Notes, but he was also helped block a takeover of the group by the Progressive Labor Party. He was also spied on by every intel agency you can imagine, and his files are tens of thousands of pages along. Oh. Mike, oh, even uh, in Chicago, yeah, right. Mike ended up in Chicago as one of the staff of the New Left Notes, but was also, I'm sorry, yes, even then, when he figured who was You've an informer. you lost me, Tim. Where are you? Trying to get the last three paragraphs. Oh, tens of thousands. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, even then, when he figured out who was an informer or policeman in the group, he would tell them he knew and then ask them what they thought of the Vietnam War. Perhaps that is why, after the war, he was approached by three intel agencies and asked to join. He declined. When Al and Tipper Gore went after music and wanted the government to regulate it, Mike joined with Julio Biafera, and the Floyd Boy Foundation to state... Yellow Biafra. Okay, no. Yellow Biafra. And With the dead Kennedys, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Tonight, he is here to speak about the importance of free speech, the importance of creating a new movement, and its lessons from the past. Mike takes bold position, positions. He often shocks with his revelations, but when it comes to free speech, his body and mind are on the line every time. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mike Flores. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting that we had Chuck mention coming up the uh, Soapbox Weekend, the Free Speech Weekend. A couple of years ago, I did the Free Speech Weekend, and I was kind of shocked when I discovered there was a whole range of topics that weren't allowed. So they were doing a free speech soapbox weekend, but you couldn't bring up the Middle East. You couldn't bring up terrorism, which two years ago I think was kind of important. Um, then they had people circulating in the crowd who would go to each speaker and just blurt things out without listening to the response. I.e., they would go, no, you're wrong. 
Then they go to the next speaker. No, you're wrong. Just from rote. There was no reason for it. That's just the pretend anachronistic world of free speech that we have today. You have free speech at this weekend coming up. As long as you don't mention the Middle East, as long as you don't mention terrorism, everything should be fine. That's what got me thinking about how this movement, this world that we are in now began. And it began with the free speech movement. Now, to understand the free speech movement, perhaps it's a good idea to understand the war on free speech that's going on today. In those days, we wanted the right to talk about any issue we wanted. We wanted people who had stupid, dopey ideas to be able to express them so that we could either change their mind or at least point it out to other people. Today, the free speech movement has become a parody, a joke, the same way that the soapbox weekend of free speech with people wandering around yelling, no, you're wrong, and then walking away to yell the same thing at someone else, and then telling people they can't discuss certain issues. It's hard to hear everyone, too. It's also why today they're banning fraternities. It's also why today they're banning trigger words and events. Now a man in Chicago, in Hyde Park, University of Chicago, named Frederick Wortham, wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent. And in that book, he said that there were certain images or words that would trigger a normal person to do violent or crazed actions. A year and a half ago, his uh, studies were completely discredited. The New York Times said there is no such thing as a trigger word. However, in the year and a half since it's been exposed, in that year and a half, even though it's been shown that he faked evidence and results and lied, the kids are still learning there's trigger words. The kids are still learning if you hear a certain term, it could drive you insane and make you go violent. Now, Yale University has been fighting since October. On Halloween, two people decided they were going to organize the students to have a Halloween party. They were met by students who said, seeing witches, seeing devils, seeing demons could trigger someone to go violent on Halloween. These are not right-wing evangelists. These are not right-wing Christians. These are our kids. These are the people we have taught to fight free speech, to be afraid that a word could make a demon appear. And these kids consider themselves leftists, even though they're undoing the free speech my generation fought for on campuses. Even though they're undoing 
and bringing back the college as the parent which my generation ended they think they're progressive by fighting Halloween parties to keep people from becoming witches I wish I could say this wasn't colleges like Harvard Yale Princeton but it is and it's starting there and it's starting to spread across the college spectrum every single thing we fought for in the 60s is in the process of being reversed by people using left-wing rhetoric to bring about what every far right winger always wanted. They always wanted censorship of popular culture. They always wanted censorship of free speech. Now, what was the new left? What was why was it called the new left? What made us different than what had happened before Students for a Democratic Society, before the free speech movement? What made us different? But there was also a new right because conservatives in that time chose between Barry Goldwater and being against the Vietnam War and those who supported the Vietnam War. So it wasn't just the new left that was created, there was a new right. And the new right was in the same boat we were in because those against the Vietnam War in 1964 were a small minority, whether they were left or right. So we had to work together, whether we liked it or not. The old left distrusted us. One of the reasons was we didn't buy in to unions have never made a mistake. We didn't believe solidarity forever. Every union is good. There's never been a union that did anything bad. We knew the Teamsters. We knew that was a fucking lie. But the communists didn't trust us. The socialists didn't trust us. Because we weren't coming at the issues from the old class awareness, the old rich versus poor. We were coming forward and saying, look, if you're not going to fight the Vietnam War to win, if you don't have a definition of victory, then you're just killing people and maiming people for nothing. We need to know what the definition of victory is. Now think about today. How do we define the definition of victory against ISIS? Why are we back in Iraq? What is our goal? What is the definition of victory in these countries where the Democrats and the Republicans have led us into war? We're not allowed to even ask that. And if you try to ask it on a college campus today, you're going to see people who call themselves left-winger come forward and shout you down. How dare you be a racist and say that President Obama hasn't stopped the wars in the Middle East. How dare you be a racist and say that President Obama hasn't closed Gitmo. You're a racist. He hasn't done those things. I don't think I'm a racist. We also did something back then that no one does today. We protested both parties. What happened to the anti-war movement? 
the last seven years, they said, well, at least the Republicans not in. We're at the right war now. We're fighting the right war in Afghanistan. That's where we should have been all along. Does anyone in this room believe that bullshit anymore? And yet, that's what you hear. We set up this problem. When I went to the Art Institute, where I had taught at the School of the Art Institute, I taught 20th century uh, art history, and I also taught film history at the School of the Art Institute. I said I wanted to do a talk based on declassified files from the CIA on the use of abstract expressionist art and how the CIA took this art form that was selling paintings for two or three hundred dollars and then started selling them for twenty thousand, a hundred thousand, a quarter of a million after the CIA agents bought them for two or three hundred dollars. And I had all the paperwork. I had all the proof. They believed by teaching abstract expressionism, it would break the Soviet realist form of art. And I was told that if I taught a class at the Art Institute on how art is evaluated, how its price is determined, and how the CIA was able to manipulate it, the entire faculty would walk out. Why? It doesn't make the CIA look good that they manipulated the art world. What were they afraid of? What are we doing? But today, those kids who don't realize they are fighting free speech are listening to the professors who are saying, if you want to come in here and tell us the truth about CIA and art, we will walk out. We will not allow you to do it. If you bring those papers in, you're out of here. Now, why shouldn't an art school care about how art becomes worth money? Why are they afraid of that? Because by me getting up and using documents to show the CIA manipulated that art world and made a profit because they were buying it for two or three hundred dollars a painting, knowing there were going to be art galleries set up by CIA that showed it, knowing there were going to be art critics in magazines like Art Forum who were CIA, who were going to write about how great it was, and all of a sudden they could sell that $300 painting for a hundred grand. Guys in CIA cleaned up. Great story, I thought. And yet the professors are standing there saying, if you tell the kids where that came from, how it happened, and what it's worth, we're going to walk out. We are going to leave. And the kids who are now blocking speakers from speaking, who are now waging war on free speech, have only learned it from those professors. Um, do, you want to, do you want to go to that first video, Mike, or not? Uh, yeah, why don't we do the, the first video here? That's this is only one, about five minutes long. That's the one on Mario Savino? That one? No, that not that one. It's uh we'll get it. Uh, right here. I think it's this one. I think it's the one you just downloaded. Yeah. Oh there you go. All their students are getting the apps. Organizations are getting the apps for standing up this semester and for fighting for these things. They're getting the axe not for what they did, 
but for what we have done. They spoke for us, they were part of us, they have been singled out, and they're going to be chopped off. We were told the following. If President Kerr actually tried to get something more liberal out of the regions in his telephone conversations, why didn't he make some public statement to that effect? And the answer we received from a well-meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? That's the answer. Well, I ask you to consider, if this is a firm, and if the Board of Regents are the Board of Directors, and if President Kerr, in fact, is the manager, then I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees, and we're the raw materials. But we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product, don't mean, don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, but human beings. <laughs> of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, by all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine won't be prevented from working at all. Okay. The free speech movement is what began everything that we now have in terms of dissent and protest because it was separate. In fact, when those kids um, on the West Coast began doing their sit-ins and takeovers, guess who wasn't there? The Communist Party. They had no idea what to do with these people who were not united with labor, who were not united um, with backing Russia or whatever. This was something totally new when it started. But because it began with free speech, under the umbrella of free speech, we would have everything from feminism to the black power movement to the Latino strikes on the farms. All of this came from that point by bringing free speech as the main issue. Everything else, the anti-war movement, everything else flourished. And the communists and socialists would eventually come on board. Now, civil disobedience is when you sit down to protest, for example, um, I don't know how many of you remember the Pentagon demonstrations, the first anti-Vietnam War public demonstrations, where Allen Ginsberg and others tried to raise the Pentagon off the ground, which the press had a field day with. But they didn't stop the war machine, and they didn't stop the Pentagon. Civil disobedience is when you, if they had, instead of surrounding the Pentagon and calling for the building to rise up in the air, which didn't happen unless you were really on a lot of drugs, um, <laughs> What if they had surrounded the building and just sat down and not let people in or out? That's a very key difference between someone with a mask throwing a rock through a Starbucks window and someone actually taking a stand that makes a point and that is effective. Now, right now, the terms they use on colleges that they believe should not be included in free speech are trigger, a word or event that can trigger a violent response in someone who is otherwise not violent. 
um, the phrase, anytime you hear somebody say trigger, they're really talking about voodoo. The idea that you can see something and it changed your whole reality in a movie or hearing it from a music song or whatever. Um, hate speech is not considered part of free speech. Sexist speech is not considered part of free speech. Racist speech is not considered part of free speech unless it's anti-white. Um, being pro-meat is not, I mean, it, the list goes on and on of all these things the kids have been taught by their bullying professors of our age uh, that are not to be allowed. But what is free speech? Free speech is hearing the words you don't agree with, you don't want to hear, you find offensive. Okay? The reason the police surround the FBI informers who are, oh, I'm sorry. The reason the police surround the Ku Klux Klan protesters. You know what they say, for every 12 Ku Klux Klan protesters, there's eight FBI informers. But uh, anyway, um, the I, th I think the thing to remember here is that in college you can be stupid. In your 20s you can be stupid. You can say the dumbest crap imaginable that you heard your uncle say when he was drunk one Thanksgiving. You know, but in college you get to be challenged on it. You get to be exposed to new ideas until now. Now you're not allowed to say something stupid. It doesn't mean you stop thinking it. It just drives it underground. <laughs> now, when I look back on the 60s and what I went through organizing, demonstrating, um, I had a Chicago policeman lay me down on the ground put a gun up to the back of my head, cock the trigger, and say, do you think I have the guts to pull it? This was because I picked up a box of flyers about a demonstration. Okay? Um, I was in Chicago. I was at 1225 South Wabash, Wabash and Roosevelt Road. It's now a gas station. But at that time, it was the only building that would rent to leftists, other than the IWW, who had a deal from years before. But everybody from the Socialist Party to us to all these other groups were in this one building, which of course made it easier for them to eavesdrop on us. But they at least had us all together. And in that neighborhood, when I first came to Chicago, was wild. There were syringes in the doorway. I saw a gun shoot out between a couple of pimps in the middle of the street. It's hard to believe that if you go to Roosevelt Road and Wabash Avenue today, it's all high rises, beautiful buildings. I bet there hasn't been a gun shoot out there in a long time. I also had my first Italian beef at Cleopatra's on Wabash, which had uh, belly dancers on Friday and Saturday night. So for a southern boy, I'm like, Italian beef sandwich, this is awesome. We never had anything like that. And you had belly dancers. I mean, I was in heaven. <laughs> uh, and there we were at 1225 South Wabash. And for expressing my free speech, I had a gun put up to my head. Um, I am actually in the last speech Fred Hampton ever gave with the Black Panthers. Um, I had been working for the Black Panther free breakfast program and uh, I had 
written a piece for New Left Notes where I said the Black Panthers should not challenge the police or threaten them with guns. I said, you can't even talk about revolution until you have at least one military unit willing to follow you. Don't be insane, you dopes. Uh, and they're going to get you for threatening them. And Fred Hampton gave a speech a few weeks before he died where he said, we do not need Michael Flores's reactionary criticism. It is our right to have arms and to use them against the police. He was shot to death in his sleep. Okay, I wish he had listened to me. But um, anyway, because of the actions of my generation, we now have a college generation which has lost free speech, doesn't appreciate different ideas, and shouts it down instead and stops it from being spoken. This is not going to lead to anything good. Now, I had come up with some ideas for how a new movement of free speech should begin. Because I think those of us who were involved in the struggle back then should speak up to these kids and say, no, it isn't about not allowing someone to speak you don't agree with. I don't care if it's Israel, Palestine, I don't care who you don't agree with. College should be where you hear those ideas. And that they're not doing that is not what we wanted, is not what we fought for. So how would a movement today look that began with free speech and reached out to people, look, you may not like Donald Trump, I don't. You may not like Bernie Sanders, I don't. But the people following those two people are angry as hell at what this society has become, what it's doing. There should be room for both of them to speak because their complaints are almost identical, even though their solutions are very different. The first thing is, in my idealized world of a new free speech movement, we stress having fun. Fun. Come to our event. You're going to hear wild and crazy ideas, but you know what? You're going to have fun. You can bring your family. You can bring your kids. Now, I did write in my description no more folk singers at rallies ever okay you can have a folk singer or two but the fact of the matter is kids today like djs and they're into electronic dance music you get one DJ <coughs> who is popular to play at your event you're going to have a lot of people there um i saw I, I went to Pilsen for an illegal rave one year, and I'm always afraid of these illegal raves because I'm the oldest person there. So I know if the police come, they're going to look at me and go, you, come here. Uh, they're not going to buy that I'm not behind it, right? Um, I haven't been busted yet, so it's fine. But um, a year and a half later, I was at a dubstep, I had gone from the dubstep event, there was probably 120, 150 kids there at the illegal rave, and I was dancing at Soldier Field with 40,000 people to DJ Skrillex. Just like it was important in the 60s to win over people like Bob Dylan, who, were, who was won over, Joan Baez, etc. It's important to win over these DJs who also have a political conscience and can bring thousands of people to your demonstration. 
the model for a free speech movement today should be the free speech movement of the 60s where you had people who supported Goldwater, libertarians, beatniks, hippies, socialists, and capitalists all working together. And from that base, the movement of the 60s would begin. I can't say what happens when you mix all those people together, how that movement will progress, what will change and happen, I just know that change in that will happen, just based on what I've been through in the 60s. Now, by having the key slogan, be free speech, we create an umbrella for people of different types to get together and talk. From that, we begin organizing. From that, movements begin, and that's what happened before, and that's what needs to happen now, not censoring free speech. I also said no more incestual protests. Here's a problem. We have 40, 50 groups that show up with four or five people, and they all get to speak. So if you're just a passerby, and you're against the war, for pro-free speech, whatever, you have to go along with all these stupid laundry list of demands that come with every group. Oh, you can't just be against um, Gitmo still being open. You have to, for some reason, support Palestine over Israel. Why? What's the connection? Let those four or five people who can't organize a demonstration on their own go out and organize for that. So the incestual thing that we've fallen into because we're not letting in enough young people, this incestual thing is not good. And those groups have to be told, if you're coming to our free speech rally, the only sign you carry is for free speech. If you have other issues, you bring them up at your rally. Okay. Next video, Mike, or not? Um, yeah, why don't you show the next video? The Ralph Nader one? Huh? The Mario Chavior. <laughs> yeah, the Mario. I think we just did this one. Well, which one did you have? Uh, well, we can just wait for the Ralph Nader. Okay. I'm not sure. We can just wait. No, I can put, okay. Um, it's a free speech thing. You can't talk about these topics. The thing to remember is when the U.S. peace movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement started, there were so many demands you couldn't believe it. The progressive labor had uh, 32 hours work for 40 hours pay, which had nothing to do with Vietnam. Youth Against War and Fascism, they had their own. All these little groups that were all at war with each other over who was more socialist than the other, yawn, um, had their own demands. But the only way it would work is if they would take one demand for the demonstration and whether that was free speech or against the war in Vietnam, that's all they were allowed to bring up. They couldn't bring up black power. They couldn't bring up this. At that demonstration, you just said you were against the war. And that movement grew and grew and grew. And yes, the other movements grew too. But the main thing was find one issue that you all stand behind. Um, the cities with the largest peace movements, which grew out of the free speech movement,
had rallies that resembled rock concerts. Uh, the Great Speckled Bird in Atlanta, Georgia, would do peace demonstrations with the Allman Brothers playing. So they were bringing thousands of people who may not even understand the Vietnam War, but wanted to see the Allman Brothers. Same thing today with DJs. And it's the same kind of pull. And it works. Um, Atlanta's hippie scene political movement went on almost six years after the one in Los Angeles and San Francisco had died because they were tied in with the music. If you were into the music, you were anti-war. Went over a major DJ, folks, you'll have the biggest fundraiser you could ever imagine. Kids pay, well, to see Tiesto uh, play in front of 250 people. He usually plays in front of thousands. The tickets were $250 a piece. They sold out in 20 minutes. You went over somebody like that, and you were talking about creating a, a real wallet to back your movement. Now, I think that in order to keep a free speech movement, ideally, um, you can't allow the people that have been told by us, our generation, that the one percenters somehow include the woman who has a franchise with Starbucks. You want to talk about one percenters? Then talk about the defense industry and the middlemen that make all the money. Don't tell me the woman who has a Starbucks franchise should have a rock thrown through her window. And if you want to keep a movement fun and free and progressive, when you see someone throw that rock, you have to stop them and turn them over to the police. That kind of crap cannot be tolerated. All anti-free speech activity is negative and should not be encouraged or looked the other way at. Now, this is the most controversial part. If I was creating an ideal protest movement today, I would reach out to Intel. Without a branch of the political parties that can be trusted, let's look at some facts from our recent past. Before Bush invaded Iraq, and by Bush I mean Bush II, which some of you know as Shrub, but whatever you call <laughs> Bush Jr., invaded Iraq, there were a half dozen books that came out, put out by people who were either in CIA or had been in CIA, trying to tell us the truth that we're saying there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Guess what all six of those authors have in common? Not one was asked to speak at any anti-war rally. Can you imagine what the press, not only the world press, but world governments would have done if a CIA agent had gone up to the microphone and said, President Bush is wrong. No one even asked them. Traditionally, intel has been feared by protesters, used as scapegoats for attacks and assassinations. Speakers actively in intel or who have written books or criticized their own company should not only be welcomed, 
But the way to reach out for them or reach out to them is to say, we support your right to whistleblow. If you see something wrong, if you see something illegal, we support your right to come forward and say this is happening. And we believe there should be something in place to protect you when you do. That's how we reach out to Intel. But the fact that they were speaking out against the war in Iraq and no one on the left thought to ask them to speak about it is sad, is sad. The next problem is the problem we've had for the last seven years, which we've passed on to our kids. We're against the wars in the Middle East, as long as there's a Republican in the White House. The minute a Democrat comes in, no more demonstrations. We can wait. Not a problem. Seven years. Now I remember when 36,000 kids blocked Lakeshore Drive because President Bush, or Shrub, was sending troops to Iraq. How many tens of thousands of kids have blocked Lakeshore Drive over Obama sending troops to Iraq? Can we say none? By telling kids they should not criticize Democrats ever. Keep your mouth shut. Don't ask Rahm Emanuel where the pension money is. Look the other way. Do what you're told. If there's anything good about Bernie Sanders, it's that for the first time, I have heard Democrats who have been silent for seven years finally say what my party is doing is wrong. But it took Bernie Sanders running to make them do it. Before that, they kept their mouth shut. If they found a place in Holman Square where people were being tortured, look the other way. If we're sending troops in, look the other way. That has to stop. In an ideal new left, we criticize both parties. Now, free speech becomes anti-war speech, but it also becomes something that some Bernie Sanders and some Trump supporters and some libertarians are all thinking right now, we need a third party. In fact, for the first time in my life, I've heard people speculate about a third party. I see a beginning umbrella of a free speech movement growing to be an anti-war movement and then calling for a third party. Um, you want to show that Rand Paul clip now? And yes, then I'll make I will. one final comment. Okay. The Ron Paul Ralph Nader. Tonight on Freedom Watch, a very special event. Libertarian and Tea Party hero Ron Paul and icon of the left Ralph Nader. Think they couldn't disagree? Think again. Congressman Paul, Mr. Nader are with us now in a rare interview. Congressman Paul is the author of End the Fed. Ralph Nader is the author of Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. Gentlemen, welcome to Freedom Watch. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, to you uh, first. You, you have recently said that uh, Congressman Paul and the Tea Party Republicans are different than the other Republicans in the Congress. What do you mean by that? To the extent that they are genuine libertarian conservatives and not corporatists, corporatists believe in corporate government, uh, they are uh, great allies with uh, many liberals and progressives 
uh, to challenge the bloated, wasteful military budget, to challenge undeclared wars overseas, to challenge hundreds of billions of dollars in corporate welfare, uh, handouts, giveaways, uh, bailouts, uh, to challenge the invasiveness of our civil liberties and civil rights by the notorious Patriot Act, to challenge the sovereignty shredding, job destroying, the NAFTA and World Trade Organization agreements, and also to uh, the first victory uh, will be a powerful whistleblower bill that libertarian conservatives and li liberals and progressives in the Congress almost got through last year to let government employees ethically blow the whistle on corporate rapaciousness and contracts and government misdeeds. Right, Just think of that agenda for a dynamic political force. All right, Ralph, you, you, I mean, you have given enough topics there for us to talk for two hours. We only have about ten minutes. And, and you're both friends of mine, and we both have chatted about these issues. But Congressman Paul, almost everything that Ralph Nader just said, you could have said, and you have said. Is this a coalition of the leading libertarian in the Congress and one of the leading progressives in American culture today? Well, you know, I believe in coalitions. You know, they always talk about uh, bi we need more bipartisanship. And I say we have too much bipartisanship because the bipartisanship here in Washington endorses corporatism, which Ralph and I disapprove of. But, you know, coalitions are different. Uh, Ralph and I do have some disagreements, but that list he just made, I agree with him on that. So I think we should come together and work together, and I think we can. As a matter of fact, we had a little project during the last campaign where I got progressives and libertarians and conservatives together, and we actually had an agreement that we shouldn't be having deficit financing. We didn't agree on where to spend and who to tax and all that, but we had an agreement that, you know, these runaway deficits are horrible for us, and of course, uh, we even mentioned the Fed and we got an agreement. So I think there's a lot of room for progressives and uh, libertarian conservatives to, uh, to work together. Uh, Ralph, uh, Congressman Paul, of course, has been the leading member of Congress on auditing the Fed and on ending the Fed. You probably support him on both of those, don't you? Well, the Fed is uh, completely out of control. Uh, it, it, it's not under any legal controls that Congress can really enforce. I mean, look at the bailouts over the weekend. Uh, last year, a year and a half, a little over a year ago, on Citigroup, three hundred and fifty billion dollar bailout in secret. Uh, the banks fund the Fed. It doesn't go through the congressional appropriations process as it should under our Constitution. It needs an audit, and I think uh, Congressman Paul is, is teaming up with hyper progressive Senator Sanders uh, to bring the Fed into openness and greater accountability. So that's another political dynamic that can increase and force and power in Congress. All right, Congressman Paul, the last time we talked about, since the last time we talked about this, there's been a change, and that is the new Congress has come in, the Republicans are numerically superior in the House, and as a result of this, you are chair of a subcommittee of the House, one of whose jobs is to monitor the Fed. Question, will you succeed in, in serving subpoenas on Ben Bernanke to show up and have a chat with you under oath and to bring his ledger sheets with him and will he comply with those subpoenas and if he does do that can Ralph Nader sit in the front row <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, I've been doing some checking and I've been informed that for uh, the F Federal Reserve Board Chairman and Secretary of Treasury and officials in the cabinet go to the full committee. So I will not have that authority, but I may be able to do somebody that is not the full chairman of the committee. But if he does, uh, it'll have to come from the chairman of the committee. But uh, that doesn't mean that we'll go lightly on digging up for this information because Ralph is absolutely right on this thing. Actually, the Federal Reserve can have a bigger budget than the Congress. I mean, they can spend three, four trillion dollars in a year and then they don't want us to tell us. Now, one thing I did get a gentleman's agreement with on many members on the Banking Committee already is I made a suggestion. I said, why don't we uh, ask the Fed what they're going to do if they're going to spend a such certain amount of money get approval from the Congress. If they plan to give $10 billion out, why should they do that without congressional approval? It's totally out of control. It was never meant to be, and it was never the founder's intention to have a system that we have today. Last question on the Fed, and then I want to change subjects. Ralph, would you support, would progressives support, a repeal of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, stated differently, literally, legally, ending the Fed? Well, I can't speak for all of them. Uh, but, but clearly, in my judgment, uh, the Fed should be a cabinet, whatever it does, should be a cabinet 
level accountable institution. Right now, it's a private bank government inside the federal government, funded by fees from the banks and thumbing its nose at Congress. But its worst nightmare is Congressman Ron Paul, who now is head of the subcommittee overseeing the Fed. Watch for the fireworks. All right, uh, let's, let's switch gears and talk about fireworks. Congressman Paul, if we ended our military ventures in Iraq and Afghanistan tomorrow, could that not provide us the substantial and deep budget cuts that we need to prevent further borrowing and perhaps to spend less than we actually take in in tax dollars? Absolutely. This, and I think it's the easiest place to uh, cut. I mean, do we, we as libertarians might not approve of some of these medical programs, but is that the place to start or should it be overseas spending and should we have a stronger national defense by, by bringing our troops home? And I say that is the place to go. We should cut from overseas and bring the troops home. And I, I think the world would be more, more at peace. I was complaining today and they had questions about China. I said they're getting to be good capitalists. They work hard, they save money, and they buy up resources. What do we do? We send our troops out and say we're protecting our oil in the Middle East and we're draining our resources. That's, that does contribute significantly to the bankruptcy. All wars are fought with inflation, destruction of the money, which is the reason we have unemployment today. Ralph, I know, how, just you feel, I know how you feel about the wars, Ralph. I want to switch gears a little bit. Yeah, just a bunch of weeks. 30, 30 million dollars an hour. 24 hours a day we're spending on those two wars. 30 million dollars an hour. Ralph, That's WikiLeaks, what, is it a good thing for mature people in a mature democracy to know what their government is up to, let the chips fall where they may. Of course, information is the currency of democracy. Uh, and uh, without information, you don't know what the government is doing, you don't know how to uh, check it, you don't know how to uh, improve it. And uh, as, as, as Congressman Ron Paul said memorably a few days ago, uh, the Bush Cheney administration lied their way uh, to the Iraq war and lying is covering up the truth and lying is secrecy. And the same is true for millions of Americans being been subjected to surveillance in violation of federal law, which is a five year pe uh, felony. Uh, so, you know, here they're worried about WikiLeaks when we've gotten into war because of secrecy and cover-ups, uh, illegal wars, and we are putting Americans under unconstitutional surveillance. Got it. Uh, you know. All right, you, you, you two story. have been agreeing on a lot. Now, the, the hot topic of the day on which I suspect you disagree. Well, maybe I can find some common ground. I think you are both in favor of repealing the health care law. Congressman Paul, because he wants the free market to address health care. Mr. Nader, because he wants universal health care paid for by the government, which this legislation doesn't accomplish. Ralph, to you first. Health care. If you were in the Congress today, would you vote to repeal it? Yes, in favor of single payer. Full Medicare for all with free choice of doctor and hospital uh, by everybody. Everybody in, nobody out. The insurance companies have defaulted, they've demonstrated they cannot be trusted in terms of establishing a pay-or-die, pay-or-get-sick system, which is costing 45,000 American lives a year okay. who cannot get insurance to get diagnosed and treated. Congress, the better Paul, way I, I suspect you don't agree with anything Ralph just said. You have the last word. <laughs> Well, we both oppose the corporatism that's involved in medicine, and that's one thing we'd agree on. But no, I disagree with the delivery of health care by the government. Anytime the government delivers a service, the cost goes up and the quality goes down. And whether it's education or whether it's, it's medical care. So I want medical care delivered more like cell phones and TVs and computers. Because there, there's the least amount of regulation, the prices keep dropping, and poor people end up with TVs and cell phones. That's what would happen with services, too, Congress, if you just maintain the services. Congressman Ron Paul, Ralph Nader, thank you for joining us on Freedom Watch. It's public funding and private delivery it, is what single payer is. Got it. Coming up, a man who refused to let... Ralph Nader and Ron Paul saying that we need to start talking to each other and coming up with ideas. Okay? So I'm not the only one saying this. Okay? Now, the young have been cynically manipulated into taking back every victory we had in the 1960s. They think 
They're keeping our spirit alive. When they stop people from speaking. When they ban Halloween parties. When they say they don't want to learn ancient history anymore because it could trigger white imperialism. What kind of voodoo world do they live in where they can't hear an opposing point of view and not have their whole reality shattered? I think it's important that we speak out against the war on free speech at Princeton, at Harvard, at Yale, because that war will spread to other colleges. And right now is the time to say, this is not what we fought for. And you're actually going back to everything that takes your freedom away. And this is a time that we need more freedom. Thanks. Okay. Oh, that's too easy. You can't get away that quick. Uh, we have you. questions. I and, bet you do. And, and you got to respond. You don't the, have the, to the have the mic, all Mike. the answers, but you have some of them. At the mic. If, if I don't have an answer, I'll tell a good joke. Okay. <laughs> all right. Where are your questions? Yes. Yeah, Mike, you were you were amazingly cohesive and to the point tonight. Uh, For an where Irishman. exactly <laughs> is your current political home? Uh, you have at times sounded like a libertarian. You have at times sounded like an intelligent Republican. Uh, of which is what twenty? <laughs> <laughs> but 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 where exactly? Where exactly are you coming from? Where do you hang your political hat these days? Well, um, I still believe in the new left. Uh, I, it was Studs Terkel who I got to meet and watch Son of Svinguli with, which I think is wild, watching Svinguli, the horror TV show, with a Pulitzer Prize winner. But, uh, uh, I asked him about Russia, and he said that the reason he hated Russia was that our left wing, which had been the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, which had been the early trade union groups, were all put on a bottom shelf when the communists came in. And Russia's needs and Stalin's needs became the needs of the left. And he said it totally twisted and distorted the American left. I want to see an American left that's not just promoting the ideas of a foreign and sometimes enemy power, but is stressing free speech. And as a libertarian, and you know I'm a libertarian, um, I do not care one bit if gays marry, if there's polygamy, if people want to take drugs. I don't care. It's, that's not important to me. That's not, uh, I think, a big deal. So socially, I support what would be considered left-wing ideas. But when it comes to the economy and wars, I'm a conservative. I don't think we should go to wars unless we have a definition of victory. I think going into a war with no definition of victory just ends up being a quagmire. It happened in Vietnam. We're watching it happen now. So I would say on social issues, I'm progressive. On economics and war, I'm a conservative. I don't want one soldier dying unless he knows why. Hey, Doug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, um, what did you think of uh, Occupy Wall Street and um, what, uh, what are the reasons why it failed or disappeared? I think um, Occupy Wall Street really impressed me when I first saw it happening 
But then I saw the Democratic Party, and maybe I'm wrong in this and somebody can correct me, manipulate a group called Move On and take it because the Occupy people were protesting both parties. Move On stepped in, moved people towards their agenda, and for seven years, Move On has had no demonstrations against the wars in the Middle East. They've become the cheerleaders of the Democratic Party. Um, what we have learned is that being a cheerleader for the Democratic Party, looking the other way at corruption, looking the other way at police brutality, looking the other way at money being stolen, how in the hell did Mayor Daley, not the real Mayor Daley, the fake Mayor Daley, how did Mayor Daley's family end up with a multi-billion dollar company in Moscow when our pensions and our money here in Illinois is gone, isn't there? How did that happen? We're not allowed to ask. I say we should have the right to criticize both parties. And I'll tell you, the best thing about Bernie Sanders, and I'm not a big fan of his, but the best thing about Bernie Sanders is that Democrats I know who would not criticize what was going on did. They came forward and said, the Hillary Rahm Emanuel wing of the party is corrupt. Now, if they pick Elizabeth Warren, will those people then shut up and go, okay, you can go back to torturing, you can go back to this, and you can do this and that, and we're going to keep stealing every dime that isn't nailed down? Or will the left say this time, no, no. We're not going back to business as usual. Rom, Hillary, you're corrupt. You're everything that's wrong with the Democratic Party. That I'd like to see. All right. Gary? Yes, Gary Levitt, L-E-A-V-I-T-T. -T. Two questions. Um, do you think we could learn uh, from other countries? And that's a whole big subject. I have a feeling the arrogance of this country, thinking God blesses it and God sense of grace on it are rather problematic and if you can state who you think would be the best president for our up and coming collection because I respect you a great deal. Um, actually uh, I think that the question we should be asking ourselves and, and perhaps many of you already are, perhaps many of you are already asking this question how did we reach the point where Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are the best this country has to offer. How did we reach the point where these two clowns, these two caricatures, are the best that we have, the best people this country can have? And uh, I can't pick anybody from that mess. I will probably end up voting well, you know, I live in Illinois, I live in Chicago, so any vote that isn't Democrat is a wasted vote. Um, so if I support the Libertarian Party and they get at least 5% of the vote, they get tax money, matching funds. So that seems like a good cause to me. So I'll probably vote like that. But uh, uh, Trump and Hillary are the best we have. Who honestly believes that? Uh, yes, uh, Charles and... Am I correct? A libertarian comes here and tells us Democrats he's upset. A libertarian is telling us Democrats we got our president elected that we should go out and protest against him when he inherited some Republican wars. And I don't understand this. This doesn't... It's, you, if, you well, were Demi, if you were a Democrat, yeah. it would make sense. But since you are announced and you just told us you're another political party, why doesn't your party protest them? But don't give instructions to another political party. 
Why well, should we listen to you? I'm Why aren't you at a libertarian meeting <laughs> telling them to protest? And the libertarians. I'm not aware. As a matter of fact, I'm not aware the libertarians ever protesting anything. When are they ever going to do it? When are they ever going to exercise this free speech you've been talking about? They're a small party. I made some one guy on TV, he was that it was about 10 years ago. That's it? No, it wasn't 10 years ago. Where's the libertarian right. protest? Here's, here's where you should have protested. You're telling us you, where you should protest? You should have protested the moment that the Democratic Party stole your pensions. You should have said, what do you mean you want an Olympics? You should have stood up and you should have said, how dare you take our pension money? No Olympics has ever made money in 200 years. How dare you do that? How dare you promise us pensions you knew all along you were never going to pay? You have promised Chicago policemen a hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year to two hundred thousand dollars a piece. That's the state of Illinois. Well, yes. I'm, I'm just saying you should have protested your party when they decided they were going to run a president with a no experience because they believed that having a black president would mean they would get the Olympics. I call that Bridgeport thinking. I call it tokenism, and you should have protested right then. Instead, when I saw the footage of the demonstrate or the rally in Grant Park, I saw President Obama, or soon to be President Obama, say, "Now we can fight the real war in Afghanistan." And all you guys stood up and cheered. If you're anti-war, then you're anti-war. You're not anti some wars, you're anti-war. And the minute you guys bought into Afghanistan being the right war, you got to send deeper and deeper into the mess. Wait. Good war. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Wes. Uh, Wes Wagger. So, uh, <laughs> if, uh, if I have a party on Halloween, I could be prosecution. <laughs> well, I, I think it was, actually the sad news is, I, I think it was Princeton University where the two people stood up for free speech, said the kids should be allowed to have a Halloween party. It wasn't bringing in Satanism or the devil or anything. They just resigned yesterday because they couldn't keep having their meetings disrupted. Um, by the way, uh, Yes, black lives matter, blue lives matter, white lives matter, brown lives matter, all lives matter. And to use that as a way to disrupt free speech, block speakers, is not what we had in mind when the free speech movement started. We didn't even pull that crap when we were in SDS, when we protested the ROTC people who were coming on campus, we picketed, we sat down, we didn't threaten people. We didn't block people from going in and call them racist. We didn't do any of that. We did, I said, civil disobedience is a real tactic. Gangsterism, bullyism, threatening is not a tactic. And that's what is happening on colleges today. And if we don't speak up and say that's not what we fought for, it's going to get worse and it's going to spread. And we need to speak up now. Okay, yeah. let's. Um, uh, yes, Raj. Raj Patel. Uh, are, you, are you stuck in the. Those were the days my friend I something never end. Those were the days my friend, I thought it would never end. That old town, 
time had that the time had gone by. Time had passed. I do not see what you are saying. I see lot lot of the exchange of opinions everywhere. Okay, and uh, I think people are accepting that there are differences of opinions. They are talking even Jewish people, and I'm very I'm a big Nestle critic, and I go there. And they accept my views, and we have a good exchange. I do, I do not I do not see in New York New York City colleges, Arabs and Jews. They are students. They are they are doing very well, just talking and negotiating and arguing and debating. They are doing very well. So where where do you see all this all these things? Well, actually, um, at Yale University, less than two weeks ago, an exhibition on uh, Israeli and Israel's military photo exposition was disrupted and stopped. Um, one student was asked by a radio station, um, do you blame the Jews for all the problems? And the person said, oh no, we don't want to kill all the Jews, we only want to kill all the Zionists. Ah, this is not acceptable speak. This is not but, free but speech. But who are you? Who are you to judge that? Let them do Somebody who's had decades of dealing with free speech issues, that's they read the Bill of Rights, the can Constitution. Get... Okay. You, you, can you don't that. have the right to go. All Zionists have to be executed. I'm sorry. The, I mean, Jews have a right to say that I'd rather kill all Arab. Good Arab is dead Arab. Okay. Not around I'm me, fine. they don't. No, but not around you, but they say. And it's good. I, I don't mind it. Okay. And if they say vice versa, I don't mind it. Okay. Because I think what is happening in New York City, there, those Jewish, Jewish girls and guys, and those Muslim boys and guys, I think there could be more marriages because of this thing going on there. I'll okay? tell you, here's what I'm proposing. By having the umbrella of free speech, okay, just the umbrella, all of these issues can be discussed. How do I know this? Because it's what happened in the 60s. I know. We yeah. had libertarians, we had conservatives, we had moderates, we had Goldwater supporters who we used to laugh at. And you know what? What they said about the Vietnam War ended up being true. More true than we were hearing from LBJ and JFK. Okay, I got it. That's the good thing about free speech. The issues you're raising, we can raise them under that umbrella. But when that issue takes over free speech and invalidates free speech, then that issue should not be there because it, it's we've got to get the kids to the point where they can just hear new ideas and not just follow their professors in banning new ideas. All right, we got a brief two-minute clip that we can close out with. It's okay. what Ronald Reagan says. Oh, wait, she, she's had her hand up. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay. We got time. Go ahead, ask your question. Oh, hi. I recommend a book uh, anyone wants to read. It's called The Watchman's Rattle by Rebecca DeCosta. And it's about how our faulty thinking is causing our problems. And really, we have solutions, but. Money speaks louder and corporations speak louder than any of us and unless we acknowledge our problems and work together, she talks about five ways that our thinking has allowed money and corporations to ignore the real solutions to our problem. I mean, there is a problem with health care and I'm in the health care field, or I was, I'm still in it in a different capacity. but. Uh, Health care today is not a, uh, how shall I say, a healing driven profession. The only thing doctors learn in medical school are drugs and surgery and if you become their victim then, I mean, most people have no idea of what's out there in terms of healing themselves. Okay. So. No, we thank you for the recommendation, but this is the question. You're going to have a chance yes. to rebut in a minute. Is yes, that the book you're next, Agnes? Is the rebuttal? Oh. Okay. Is this the book? Is this the book you're talking about yeah, on the you screen? Yeah, five minutes. The Watchman's Rattle. Yes. We'll talk about Paul okay. Paul well, actually, uh, Tim, you had a question no. at the beginning. Uh, actually, I'm going to defer that question because I think we got a really good, perfect ending to Mike's speech. <laughs>
It's Ronald Reagan talking to the hippie crowd. It's about a two minute clip, and I'll get it up here and start it. Yeah. Well, not really. I don't know his number. Oh, next time. I gotta get it. I gotta get it done. Get it down. Okay, go ahead. We're allowed to assault and humiliate the symbol of law and order of policemen on the campus, and that was the moment when the ringleaders should have been taken to the scruff of the neck and thrown out of the university once and for all. As a matter of fact, I have here a copy of a report of the district attorney of Alameda County. It concerns a dance that was sponsored by the Vietnam Day Committee, sanctioned by the university as a student activity, and that was held in the men's gymnasium at the University of California. The incidents are so bad, so contrary to our standards of human behavior, that I couldn't possibly recite them to you here from this platform in detail. But there is clear evidence that there were things that shouldn't be permitted on a university campus. Let me just read a few excerpts. The total crowd that the dance was in excess of 3,000, including a number of less than college-age juveniles. Three rock and roll bands were in the center of the gymnasium playing simultaneously all during the dance. And all during the dance, movies were shown on two screens at the opposite ends of the gymnasium. These movies were the only lights in the gym proper. They consisted of color sequences that gave the appearance of different colored liquids spreading across the screen, followed by shots of men and women on occasion. Shots were the men and women's nude torsos on occasion. And persons twisted and gyrated in provocative and sensual fashion. <laughs> Who is that? What's this all? Is that Trump? I'm George W. Bush, and I approve this message. I didn't pick that, but he did, so it's all right. Actually, um, the free speech movement did start Ronald Reagan's political career. Like I said, the thing about the free speech movement is that when it was used before, it created the feminist movement, the black movement, the anti-war movement. All these movements came out of that. But also Ronald Reagan came out of that. Let's thank Mike Flores. We'll go off four minutes each for rebuttals. I'm going to take the first one. Oh, Where do we line right? up, Bram? Just very good. Where do we go? All right. You guys know that I'm a strong supporter of free speech. But I'm also a supporter of letting that speech be speak facts. And what may you what you know what you may not have known, particularly about the issue of nuclear power. How many of you have ever heard of a gentleman by the name of Adam Elvin Weinberg? who was the inventor of the light water reactor along with Rickover and the head of Oak Ridge Laboratories. He was one of the first to speak before a Senate subcommittee in 1973 about the dangers of nuclear reactors. And he was one who designed them. He was also one who spoke out on very early in the 30 years before global warming and climate change came to pass he was one of the first that also talked about it. He was also one of these guys who also came up with a solution to global climate change in the form of innovative new reactor design, particularly the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. And it behooves me to see that any environmentalist who will not consider looking into the issue again and double checking this power that within about a ball about the size of my hand could give you an, an entire amount of energy in a lifetime that could be clean and could be worked properly. But again, we have to get the designs right. Alvin, Alvin Weinberg said that society is having a Faustian bargain uh, and we're gonna have to be accustomed to social institutions of which we're not accustomed meaning that that industry will have to be regulated and have to be watched like crazy for proliferation. But we do have solutions. The second thing I also want to say about the free speech movement is this. 
it's wonderful to see free speech. But I also know, too, that I'm a proud capitalist. I like globalization. I like the fact that the United States is number one. And I, if I went to speak at some of these leftist rallies, I'd be thrown out of my ear. So, but again, I think that a lot of my positions are supported by factual evidence. Like child labor? Well, Charlie, you know, you can talk about child labor all you want. It's almost non-existent now, especially in developing countries. We've spoken about this before, that when a country develops and gets about eight, above about $8,000 per annum, ch children become more of an expense than they do a source of labor. That's how you get rid of it, on an economic basis. Yes, you need to outlaw it. Now, I'd like to thank Mike again for a good talk. I really want to say thank you for bringing these issues to light. Mike, as usual, thank you very much. We will have a four-minute clock running. Give me a Okay. Wave when I got a minute, please. I will give you, yes. Uh, Mike, uh, I thought it was an excellent talk. I've heard you before. I would say this is your best talk. I don't agree with you on a lot of subjects, but uh, it was interesting to hear your talk. One thing I don't know anything about is youth. <laughs> I'm going to talk only about civil disobedience. In this body, I heard about the book uh, uh, by Ackerman and Duvall, A Force More Powerful. I would recommend that particular what is that book. What is that? A Force More Powerful by Ackerman and Duvall. Uh, incidentally, the only, other than Charles, the only other person I know who knew the book was a community organizer at Jane Addams Senior Caucus. I read the entire book. I would most recommend it. Second thing is civil disobedience. While we ought to know something about that, here at this body, we've heard of Brad Little again and again. He's an excellent guy who's uh, gone to jail about civil disobedience several times. I think Rom was one of those also. And there's probably others in the audience. I'm familiar with community organizing civil disobedience. In fact, I got to go to court. Uh, for civil disobedience. I forget what day. I think it's June 15th or something like that. I got arrested. But hey, I wasn't lonely. There were 23 of us, only four seniors. It was very focused. It was very organized. Uh, we didn't break any windows, although we uh, stopped access to a building at one spot. So. Um, I think civil disobedience can be focused, and civil disobedience can be uh, very disciplined. And a story. All right. Hey. All right, Butler. Mike, you surprised me delightfully. So tonight's tonight's statements uh, were the kind of thing that. You know, I had always thought of you as more of an ideologue than anything else. Yours was a very pragmatic approach, whether you realize it or not, to some of the problems uh, perplexing this country. One of the things you mentioned was that a third party, a strong third party, would not be a bad idea. Now, I wouldn't share your opinion that that third party should be the libertarians, however, I do think that the time is long overdue in this country for a Labor Party. The most unrepresented people in this country are workers. These are the people who make the economic engine possible. These are the people who supposedly are the lifeblood of this country, and yet these people as a group especially in an era when unions are losing ground week by week, day by day. They have nothing to turn to. There was a time when the standard of living of the American worker in this country 
was the envy of the world. No longer so. The average worker in Germany does far better than the average worker in the United States. The average worker in some European countries gets not a two-week vacation, which an American gets if he's lucky, they get four to six weeks vacation. And yet their productivity is the equal of anything that we do in this country. We are the country that produced the beginnings of the serious labor movement. It began here. Much of it began here in Chicago. And yet we have dropped the ball. We have allowed representation by labor movements in this country, which at one time accounted to nearly 60% of the population, go down to about 15 to 17% of the population. And people are being told, you don't need labor unions anymore. Anytime you have a problem, just knock on the boss's door and he'll listen and he'll take care of you. You don't need collective bargaining to get a decent standard of living. All you need to do is go into your boss's office and ask for a raise. Two things are going to happen in that case. Typically, in the modern office today, in the modern factory today, if such exists in this country still, you go in, you ask for a raise, the boss is going to say, gee, I know you're, I know you're terribly qualified, I know you're the best worker around here, perhaps you would be happier somewhere else which might be able to meet your financial demands. Or they're going to say, gee, I'd very much like to, but we don't have the money for that. Now, during some labor negotiations, you can't cry poor mouth unless you can back it up. But if you're going to your boss individually, he can cry poor mouth all he wants, and no one is going to uh, uh, call him on it. The fact of the matter is, yes, we need a third party we need a workers' party, we need a labor party, which will get us back to the standard of living that we had 40, 50, 60 years ago. This should be the primary issue that we should be talking about today in the upcoming presidential election. Who's going to do that? Who's All going right. to deliver? I grant you the two candidates who appear to be emerging are a joke. You're over, Pat. But we got to deal with it, and I'm over, and I'm going to get my throat slit if I don't. <laughs> very good, very good. Let's thank you. Hey. All right, Lee, let's go. Rock and roll. Now, Mike Lee. All right. I think uh, Mike is lamenting the demise of free speech and protesting from the conventional uh, eras. But the government and... Uh, our authorities don't want us to protest anymore. They make it extremely difficult to do that. So, yeah, it's pretty un-American, but, you know, it's uh, the war economy that the war society we're in now for the last 15 years. <clears throat> so, free speech has definitely went down. Also, now that uh, Wall Street owns all, most of our medias, commercial media is the, uh, the right questions are not being asked, the wrong interviews are being employed, and the quality has been hugely substandard. Uh, is this on? Yes, it is. So, uh, so I think it's uh, unfortunate that our media, the media is a laughing joke in this country compared to the quality of other countries. So that's the problem, protesting's not allowed. But on the other hand, all the use of smartphones now and chat groups and blogs and political sites on your smartphones, <coughs> on your internet, on your Facebooks, on your, all your other things, there's quite a bit of free speech and discourse and conversation. 
and it seems like that uh, you now there's, there's there's good uh, information on here. I would trust a lot of the things on the internet and uh, sources like that over our uh, American media. So that's about all I got to say. Hopefully, at our uh, our war economy and war society ends someday soon, and uh, you know, just leave all the other countries alone, and let's get off of oil, and as much as we can. Okay, next. Thank you. Thank you. But no. My name is Raj Patel, I speak for myself. I, I've been in the 60s here. And uh, I was in the Vietnam War, and I was in a Salt Lake City, Utah. And I, I used to look at a student, I was a student leader, I was a big leader in the students. And uh, there were differences of opinion there. Some people were very conservative when they were pro-war, and some people were not. In this country, when I think about national issues, I look across the country. Uh, I, I just look, open up my eyes and see whole country. Hey, what is in Tennessee? Okay, what is in California, Northern California? What is in Southern California? New York City, upstate in New York City. And there are differences of opinion. Let's be realistic, okay? And a free speech, it's there. I mean, I see lots of free speech. I got more information, access to more people's ideas and than I ever had before in the 60s. You know, in the 60s, what used to happen is that some loud mouth will go and blabber and he become famous. Okay, while people who can, who can articulate, who had a good idea, they were sewed up. They, they, nobody, nobody, they cannot, they cannot present that idea. I went to National Student Association Convention in a Champaign, Illinois in 1966, representing the University of Utah. And do you know? Who got the biggest voice, biggest biggest publicity, and the biggest coverage? But one guy who was against Vietnam War, and he was crappy hair, and he was loud, and, and, and he got the biggest thing. Lots of people have a discussing ideas, and committee meetings, and everything, and coming up with resolution, nothing. Nothing. See, there is a difference between a free speech and a real speech. But let's get over that. The real problem is that that everybody is not paying attention to do is this. Silicon Valley is thinking that 80% of the American employees are replaceable by machines. Okay, that is a big issue. And that, that is coming, and they are saying that they can do within the next 15 to 20 years. Okay, so labor issue is different. Labor issue is not a labor issue was yesterday. Labor issue is tomorrow. How do you employ people who can work technology? Or do we have a room for that? How, or how do they retire you know, early? Or whatever what we do? Those are the questions. How do we solve the problem? Bernie Sanders said, Bernie Sanders, Sanders wants to solve a problem by pay, paying a pre tuition. That is not a problem. Problem is that why should education cost so much and then we get a lousy product? We do not get a good product from high school. High school graduate cannot get 3 plus 5 equal to 8. And a college graduate higher higher. The, the, the cash register, they take more than one hour. Come on, where is the quality? And why should we spend so much money? You are spending so much money on education and not getting a damn thing. There is a, it is a time to change the, in a way we educate. In the age of computer, in the age of technology, let's get Silicon Valley involved. Okay, let's get a progressive thinker involved. So how, do we, how do we reduce the cost of education? If we cannot reduce the cost of education, we will never really educate our people. Okay? Cost of education has to come down drastically. Okay. Cost seconds. of everything has to come down. If we cannot do that, it's not going to work it. People can speak, 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 say, oh, okay, we preach, you know, blabber, 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 and nothing happens. This guy's not. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Four minutes. 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 I thought I was going to say, uh, I'm not going to rebut, because I like Michael Forrest a lot, a lot, a lot, and I'm sure I would get a lot from each talk. But uh, So I wanted to be here, but I'm a little concerned about 
when I was going to say that this is my home away from home. I'm Gary Levitt, L-E-A-V-I-T-T of Skokie. Because I just got in trouble because of Jennifer saying I was harassing people. And they didn't say I was. And earlier, I have a, I have a camera which I've used. I don't take many cam pictures. But I was allowed to take the picture of a father and a beautiful child for my own enjoyment. Not, not in any salacious way. I'm not going to sell copies. But the first thing they assume is that you're a pedophile, that there's something wrong with you, you're sick. I'm never having children, but I'm getting the idea, maybe someday, maybe a woman might accept my sperm if she knows I'm a genius, which I am. And I mean, right, the transcendent mental, transcendent mental superiority. I've been involved with therapy for about 50 years, and I've never been able to give a talk. I've never had the self-confidence, but in the last month and a half, since before the Audio Expo North America and the Western Hotel and the various things that have happened, I've made a transition from self-hate to self-love that is unbelievably stunning. I thought there was a, some kind of barrier between me and other people, but I think it's, it's over. But people assume the worst, and you have to be a genius to understand, or trained to understand what a genius thinks like, which is not difficult, it's not trigonometry. So I've had trouble with police. I went to a lecture at the University of Chicago, hosted by, introduced by C.N. Bielak, who wrote a book called Chill. And she introduced, a lady introduced the man who has, why women aren't more involved in science. His charts were nonsense. And so he was responded to by an OBGYN and a philosophy professor. I, I stepped down a few rows. I was going to say my statement, and I couldn't say it all. And I saw a person holding a phone by their ears like their hand. They called the police. I was kicked out of the building. And he said, keep walking. And I said, I'm walking. Are you blind? And he said, uh, I wanted to know his first name. And I don't have all these facts straight about keeping track of all the people who hurt me. I'm very disorganized with my notes. He said, he did, please don't have first names. And my firm voice was getting better because of personal strength and relaxation and drinking a lot. Your parents were too stupid to give you one. So if you want to cross me, if you want to cross a genius, I'll defend myself to the best of my ability. Not physically, of course. And so I went to the 57th Street bookstore and I was kicked out for life because it seemed like the people who I was talking to, the lady at the front desk and another lady liked me, but he asked me to step out, this young man, and they said I, he said I bothered them, but they didn't say that. And I, they judge you without, you know, don't judge a person until, apparently the rule is judge a person before you, by the time you've walked in, a set of, an inch in his moccasins. And they judged me without even caring to know anything about me. I'm trying to come out of my shell. I've never had a girlfriend, and I'm 65 years old, oh. and I don't want to die a virgin. So, well, Ron Jeremy said when he had a conversation with a priest on the north side, and he said, why don't you buy it? I think he's a bright guy. He's a social worker. He was, I think he won the talk about pornography. I, I should have asked, why do I have to buy it? I think I should get a sexual surrogate paid okay. for by public aid. <laughs> and like the guy in the sessions with Alan Hunt, why do I have to go to a, a brothel, or I can go to a dominatrix in most any city in the United States, but not a sexual surrogate to get pleasure. Why is that, you stupid bastard, just as Anselm Scalia? Maybe the devil is making me do this. What do I do? What a bastard. So I recently talked to two young girls outside the Stokey Library. A stupid woman came out. She said I was offending them. They didn't say that. They're freshmen at the Old North, no, Niles North. So the rich, rich, I forget his name, he says I have to have my previous counselor from Turning Point, which you call Boiling Point, say I could come back. This is unbelievably convoluted. And okay. I'd like to give my own talk, but if I have to wait till August, this is one of the major disasters of the human beings being mistreated in the history of mankind because it's happening today. And I had a coin among my okay. coins about from 1984. And you wonder what's been, what progress has happened in 22 up. years. And you see they're rushing, me, they're rushing me as if someone is going to die on the operating table, you fool. I'm trying to make a statement that's one of the greatest statements that's ever made in the We've had conference. each and everybody's allotted four minutes. Your time's up. It has to be four minutes. Your time's up. So much for free speech at the College of Conference. You had four yeah. minutes to air your grievances. Can you be flexible at all? No. We're going to be, we got one more waiting and then we got some more waiting in the wings. How much time did you take? <laughs> Let's go. We're trying to give everybody an equal opportunity. Let's keep moving. I'll collect my thoughts and he may give me a minute. Listen to finish a minute earlier. Uh, Doug Binkley, uh, and so, several times I've mentioned uh, my credentials as a uh, liberal or a leftist here uh, that I uh, was with the Citizens Party uh, in the early 80s. and. Uh, 
I actually ran the office uh, downtown uh, a few years, and the funny thing is, uh, it uh, was on Dearborn Street, uh, and I, I never got as far south as 1225 South Wabash, but at least a uh, leftist party did have an office in a different building. Uh, Mike, uh, but uh, I didn't realize uh, uh, that Mike had such good credentials oh, as a leftist, uh, and uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, uh, Citizens Party was uh, what I thought was, you know, an intelligent party of the left, the, the real intellectual uh, side what? of it, and it was mainly uh, environmental, uh, but also social issues. Uh, and it was a semi, semi kind of a socialist party, social uh, justice party. Uh, like, um, uh, similar to, you know, uh, Western Europe. Let's go outside before we somebody. At that time, uh, and of course, uh, what we accomplished by being a third party <laughs> in that year of 1980, everyone knows, and that was, we saw Ronald Reagan here up on the on the screen, uh, and uh, yeah, we gave, the, we gave the country Reagan, although uh, really, um, it was a little more complicated than that. Uh, there was a guy named uh, Anderson who was running as a liberal <laughs> Republican. I mean, how many of them are left uh, these days, uh, not many, but um, he was a liberal Republican. And what his big thing was, uh, uh, you know, tax uh, gasoline uh, big, like um, uh, make it cost as much as in Europe and people would um, stop uh, uh, driving cars as much and there would be less pollution. And uh, well, he was a forward thinking guy. I mean, you know, we probably should um, uh, be doing that as a, um, as a public policy. But uh, so he split the vote a lot, uh, uh, split votes off of uh, Carter mainly probably, uh, and um, and so Reagan got in. Uh, we only had like a quarter of a percent, uh, if I remember correctly. We were hoping for that five percent to get a uh, ballot uh, uh, guaranteed uh, status, uh, but uh, that never materialized, and uh, the Citizens Party is no more. Uh, some of the members uh, ended up in the Green Party. I consider joining the Green Party, but uh, the experience in 1980 uh, soured me on the uh, uh, use of third parties. Uh, to try to um, get actual change, uh, meaningful change in, in the time frame that were uh, uh, be in my lifetime. <laughs> and we see what has happened. I mean, we do have a two-party system, and uh, things are geared towards that with the ballot access uh, being so difficult. And of course, the lack of a, what we really need is a, an instant runoff type situation. Um, that was, uh, we really got screwed in, um, in 2000 with that uh, Nader thing of uh, siphoning just long votes off that George W. Bush got in. Uh, of course, Gore, you know, you can say, well, the Democratic Party corrupt and all of that stuff. Uh, but uh, I think uh, history would have been a lot different if we'd had instant runoff uh, because uh, the Nader people, people who voted for Nader probably would have put down Gore as their second choice. And so that election would have gone to Gore. Um, so uh, a lot of technical details like that. Um, and um, we could have third parties be uh, viable in the sense that uh, uh, people wouldn't mind uh, voting for a third party. It looks like I'm, I'm almost going to use up four minutes. Sorry about that. Uh, but um, I was just bringing a couple of my uh, personal experiences to bear here. Uh, Occupy Wall Street that I asked about, I thought that had a very good chance. Uh, uh, I still do not understand. Of course, they were kicked out um, because the parties would be finally decided to move them out like, um, like Hoover did to the uh, Hoover bills. So. But um, uh, I don't know why it didn't have a, a better presence afterwards, after they got uh, kicked out. Uh, so anyway, I will uh, stand aside. Thank you. think I could get a minute? I can I get a minute? Sounds like I should be able to, I guess there's... No, it's up to you. You can say, you can give me a minute. No, no, no. They can't. Can't you make it a little looser for me, for my sake? I love it. Look. Yes, I'm up here. There are this is a relatively it's sparsely. It's his turn. Oh, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Oh, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Party speech. Come on, Gary. It's rather not pro. Not well attended. The idea of creating a vast movement in the United States may seem a little grandiose. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
ideas, even if it's like <coughs> uh, Gary's uh, to uh, uh, overcome the uh, misunderstandings right. that understandably develop uh, when uh, you speak to uh, uh, younger people uh, 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 that you don't know on uh, the street. Uh, it's, we, we can be uh, very defensive about it, or we can let it uh, roll our far back. So we can you got it. You, you I don't. Pray. Yes. I do uh, yeah. Well, you, you look within yourself for some resources. Uh, you look to others uh, for uh, some sort of understanding. You look, at, at, but if you look hard enough, before I pass away, but how good will I find it? Anyway, when it comes to the looking for a mass move, you have to figure out uh, what the movement is, where it's going, uh, what it is you want to attain. Uh, Mike uh, wanted uh, the uh, mass movement to, to focus on a particular demand. However, everything is related, and uh, the uh, focus on uh, a car in every garage, uh, or or whatever focus uh, you can narrow it down to, okay. that seems innocent <coughs> enough, uh, is going to be offensive to some people who are going to resist that movement, and the those who might support it will have different ideas or different emphases in uh, what they figure is related to that move. Peace in our time. Well, what is peace? Uh, peace for some people is a living wage. Uh, peace for others is good health for everybody. And peace for some is Nobody interferes when I'm speaking to a couple of girls uh, on the street. You know, be friendly, but you know, or, or at least we can speak freely. Mario Savio, I saw him here. Okay. It was a great thing because I remember Mario Savio and the free speech movement. Uh, with Mario did uh, me the favor of joining my socialist party, and I, I uh, felt uh, really akin uh, to Mario. Um, okay, 15 I, seconds, Brom. All right. We've, I'm exhausted by time. You see, I've got it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we never can finish. Charles, we uh, can finish. All right. Thank Mike, you, the final word. Good for Brom. Charlie, Charlie. All right, let's thank our speaker for coming together in our program here. Uh, the eclectic as usual here. Uh, we haven't had a libertarian in a while speak at the college complexes. The last time was at the Lincoln Restaurant. That uh, attractive young lady uh, told us about the United Nations plot to take over uh, the world. Uh, I remember they said, see, that was the one where there was a, they built a housing development. Uh, it's called transit-oriented development. They built a housing unit uh, by an L station. And she was claiming it was evidence of the United Nations global relocation program taking effect because they built an apartment building near an L station. <laughs> Uh, and she had this Agenda 21 plan. Nevertheless, I'm not going to, as a person who has spent many, many years uh, working 
on behalf of Democratic candidates on uh, the federal, state, and local level. You know, I want to thank the Libertarian Party for their advice. I don't feel any compelling necessity to protest the current occupants of Democratic office holders at any level. And I'm sorry, uh, I just, yeah, I highly recommend you exercise your free speech and, hey, you have your own rallies. <coughs> you know, but don't lament the fact. Regarding the third party, I was involved in that as well, still am. Do you know there's a, there's a thing back there to the, now, okay. talking about third parties, uh, the Libertarian Party, to my knowledge, has been trying to run candidates for a long, long time. However, it was, I was involved in the, the Greens, and not only did we succeed in getting our candidate in every ballot in the United States, we also got, no, Gary, why don't you sit down? No, please, Gary, I'm going to ask you. I can get a no, no, no. Please what? sit up. You what? got in what? trouble We're with the time. restaurant, Gary. I didn't do anything Gary, wrong, Gary. Yes, Charles. Charles. I'm Charles. asking you nicely. I got reports from the waitress. She's wrong. I didn't harass well, anyone. Gary, I'm talking about the waiter. I All did right. not from the people in question. You don't believe no, them. No, let's be this nice and attend just, the college just from her. our seat. All right, let me finish. Uh, where was I at? Third party. Um, the Greens were told, uh, wait till next year, wait till next year, wait till next year. Uh, they decided not to wait till next year and ran a candidate for president and did pretty good. They got 10, 15 percent of the okay. vote. And they had to put together a party in each of the 50 states. Uh, regarding this free speech issue, uh, there was a thing a few years ago called politically correctness. Uh, we explored the topic here okay. at the college, and they also were terms that were used. Okay. They were politically correct and incorrect terminology. Uh, another thing on the campuses that came about the same time was something called multiculturalism, in that you could not be okay. critical of any culture that was not considered, that was not a, a viable position, um, and also Western civilization was evil and corrupt uh, altogether. Okay. The, all right, finishing up, the Occupy movement, by the way, became the Bernie Sanders movement. Bernie Sanders was approached by 50 of the big uh, Occupy leaders and okay. asked to run for the presidency of the United States. Okay, Charlie. And one more thing. This trigger thing ain't nothing new. Psychology has been dealing with stimulus okay. and response since the beginning right. of time, a century. And I have to listen, he took my time. I had argued as much time president. as he wants because he's a bully. Yes. You got it. All right. He agreed. So I don't know what triggers, yes, are valid. All right. So. Stimulus is to generate responses. All right, thank you. All right. Okay, hey, folks, I gotta hurry because I guess we have to be out of here in three or four minutes. Like less than but, two. But um, let me start by saying that um, I would say that one place where the Democrats should have protested and the Union should have protested was when President Obama stopped using union labor at fundraisers. So I think that would have been the, the spot to do that. Um, libertarians are not anti-union. There's no libertarian anti-union statement. Um, just adjourn, Mike, because I think we're ready. They're, they're ready to leave. I'm sorry about having to cut you off at the last minute, Mike. Well, I guess I'm being cut off before I can respond. Just take, it, just take the gavel and gavel uh, aside. One way to reduce the cost of education would be to remove the bureaucracy. There is no educational bureaucracy in Cambridge or Oxford like there is in American colleges. And they dictate a lot of these free speech things, political correctness, this huge bureaucracy. That's one thing we can do, get rid of them. Um, you can't buy love. 
but you can rent it. Um, about third parties, I do believe that if we start off with free speech, go to anti-war, a third party will develop because it's the first time we have people from both parties who are not happy. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi. And Thank you. Very good. We're adjourned. Thank you for coming. I thought we'd go on till 9. What? We got kicked out of Lincoln Restaurant. What would Lincoln say about what I said? He was